Hey, what's going on, everyone? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Three Buck Theater for the 11th of January, 2019. There is a lot to get through on the final episode of the week. As you guys can see here on the sidebar, we're going to be talking about a wide variety of topics. But uh, first things first, I want to touch upon this Avengers for Alex initiative. As we can see here on the thumbnail for today's episode, uh, it's it's a new one that's going around. And this is a good worthwhile cause. This is a good worthwhile thing to support. You have a man named Alex who is sick who believes he is not going to be around for Avengers Endgame. And people have been trying to get the support of Marvel to give him an early screening. And uh, let's find out more. So it says here, Reddit campaign asks for terminally ill fan to get early Avengers 4 screening. Following a terminally ill fans post, Reddit users are asking those involved with Avengers 4 uh, to provide a dying man with an early screening of the film. In April, the narrative that Marvel Studios had been unfolding since 2008's first Iron Man film finally comes to its conclusion in the fourth Avengers movie, which is now titled Avengers Endgame. Uh, Marvel fans all over the world are waiting impatiently for their chance to see Avengers Endgame and have since been witnessing jaw-dropping, or since witnessing the jaw-dropping ending of last year's Avengers Infinity War. Uh, yesterday, a fan using the handle Alexander Q posted to the Marvel Studios subreddit, sharing both a heartbreaking story and a simple request. Alexander is a 33-year-old man suffering from, suffering from a rare genetic disease that he says claimed the life of his sister just three years ago. He, is cur he currently has liver cancer, mouth cancer, and bone marrow failure, and is afraid he might not be around to take in a screening of Avengers Endgame when it releases to theaters. Understandably, he'd like to be able to see a copy of the film before he passes on, and it did take a long time for people to get the hashtag Avengers for Alexander trending. And basically, we have ourselves... Uh, a bit of an update here and uh, the most uh, in an update to the original post Alexander reveals that he has been told uh, people at Marvel are aware of his situation now and are planning to help him out he also says he has found he uh, found out he knows a guy who knows a guy who knows Chris Hemsworth and that the Thor actor was contacted on his behalf most of all Alexander seems moved by the outpouring of love he's received here's hoping he gets to see it and you know what I absolutely agree with that there's nothing wrong with uh, with trying to get a fan an early screening of the movie. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with trying to get somebody a, a final wish. And I know to people outside of the movie industry, outside of the movie world, it's one of those ones where you're like, mm, really? Do you really feel like this is a good a good use of time? Yeah, to us nerds, hell yeah. If I was dying, I'd want to see, you know, Avengers Endgame. They'd be like, well, you can pick one, Captain Marvel or Endgame. Like, oh man, shit, I'll... No, nah, I can sit out Captain Marvel to sell the I'll go see Endgame. Uh, but it's it's a really good thing that we're that that they're doing this. And it works on a multitude of levels. For one, it shows you that Marvel and Disney are not just some faceless conglomerate. They actually do care, which then translates to positive press, which then translates to better trust in the property and the brand. And they're doing a good thing. Everybody wins in a situation like this. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Everybody wins in one way or another. But I do very much hope that Alexander gets his wish and he gets to watch the movie before his time on this planet passes us by. So to Alexander, wherever you are, buddy, good luck. And uh, you suck for getting to see it first. But, you know, hey, uh, make, a, make a wish <laughs> happens, I guess, right? We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta rely on that, at least, at least at some point in time in our life. So jumping over here, Sony Pictures uh, is looking to, uh, to get a couple new writers. For the He-Man movie. Now, this this comes just days after it was announced that Margot Robbie is going to be doing Barbie. So, uh, obviously, uh, another Mattel property, right? Mattel Films wants to get more movies off the ground. So, why not try to reboot He-Man? Never mind the fact that the Dolph Lundgren film from the late 1980s is still a classic in my personal and professional opinion. Now, it says here, 2019 may be the year Sony Pictures moves forward with the long-in-the-works He-Man and the Masters of the Universe movie. Long in development hell, the Sony Mattel film has lost and gained as many directors as the ill-fated Crow reboot. According to our friends over at Collider, Sony has revealed that, a pair, that the pair behind Marvel Studios' Iron Man, Art McCrum and Matt Holloway, will be writing a new script for the film. Last we heard about the project, David S. Goyer has stepped in and then stepped out of directing, which is probably a good idea. Uh, so now we get to wait and see whether or not uh, they actually write the movie. But here's the thing with this. The, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, hey, I'm, I'm happy these guys got work. I I thought Iron Man was a fun movie. I really want to see what they do with it next. Uh, I'd love to see another He-Man movie. I, I, I would. I'd like to see. I don't know who would play it. Probably The Rock at this point, considering he's in everything else. But 
try, trying to go back to the guys who wrote, uh, you know, uh, Iron Man as the selling point, considering that it's frequently known, it's frequently talked about that the script was predominantly improvised by Robert Downey Jr. And, and Jeff Bridges well on set. So, you know, they were kind of working off of notes versus an actual screenplay from my understanding. So to me, that's pretty funny. But at the same time, I wish him luck. And I do hope Sony finally moves forward at this one because uh, I'd like to actually root for a Sony movie that's not tied to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, also, this is an interesting one here. Apparently, Netflix is now being sued by Choose Your Own Adventure publishers over Bandersnatch. Which got me a little bit confused at first because the choose your own adventure aspect, right, of being able to choose a, a, a fork in the path, which way you go, is not something that is you know, trademarked. Now, the name choose your own adventure, the title choose your own adventure, that's up for debate and discussion. Um, but apparently those guys are none too happy with Bandersnatch. Never mind the fact that Netflix is rocking other properties with the same exact type of, of, of experience on the platform. Now, it says here, the publishers of Choose Your Own Adventure book series is suing Netflix over its interactive Black Mirror episode, Bandersnatch. Choose Co. filed this lawsuit against Netflix today in a Vermont court, accusing Netflix of willfully infringing on the CYOA adventure, uh, trademark and claiming that the episode is so dark it will tarnish the book's reputation. Oh, really? <laughs> Come on. Come on, Choose Co. No kid. No kid is going to be reading Choose Your Adventure books and go like, man, Bandersnatch was better. I mean, maybe some of those Choose Your Adventure books from when I was a kid was, was pretty lame, but I still love it. I still love the series. I still love the books and, and I plan on raising my daughter on them. Now, the complaint as published by Polygon claims that Netflix started trying to license the Choose Your Adventure name starting in 2016 when the company's engaged in extensive negotiations. Netflix allegedly didn't get the license. Choose Co. says it already sent cease and desist notices about its trademark on at least one occasion regarding a different TV show, potentially one of Netflix's earlier child-focused interactive programs. Choose Co. takes issue with Bandersnatch's protagonist, Stefan Butler, describing a fictitious interactive no novel, which is also titled Bandersnatch, as a choose-your-own-adventure book, implying that it's uh, officially part of the series. Well, okay, well, okay, well, oh, right, let's keep going. Uh, and I'll talk about it. Uh, it's particularly upset with the reference because Bandersnatch is a dark film that can include references to and depictions of demonic presence, violent fighting, drug use, murder, mutilation of a corpse, decapitation, and other upsetting imagery. Association with this grim content tarnishes Choose Co.'s famous trademark, and they're asking for $25 million. Now, Netflix also it does want to talk quickly about the lawsuits from the Church of Satan with Netflix's The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. So there is some precedent there with Netflix maybe getting a little bit too, uh, a little bit too, uh, you know, ca uh, careless when it comes to trademarks and everything else like that. But let's look at it like this. In the line, in the, in the, in the episode, Stefan Butler does say, yeah, it's like a choose your own adventure. All right. Now that also is just synonymous with kind of pop culture. It is synonymous with, uh, you know, you know, choose your own adventure. You know what you're describing. It, it, you know, if you say a choose your own adventure book, you know what you're thinking about. If you say choose your own adventure. You have a general idea, but it's it's one that I think in the public lexicon, it can go either way. But they might, you know, they might have a case here. They 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 might have a case. I would argue that Netflix is probably just going to settle, considering that Bandersnatch was actually an insanely popular show for them. Uh, they're probably like screw it they want 25 million we'll just you know we'll offer them like 10 and make them go away considering the fact that they pulled in like god billions of dollars a month in, in revenue and i mean i was just reading yesterday and i i gotta go bring the article up but apparently like if you share your netflix account now you could lose it and considering that out of those hundred million people in the united states that have netflix accounts how many people do they share theirs with right so i mean netflix is currently looking to get more people coming on in uh, 25 million to them is quite literally nothing. They have probably made 25 million in the time it took me to tell you guys this story, but I'm curious to see if they're going to fight it or if they're just going to make it go away. But if they just make it go away, it shows you that there's a little bit of a lax uh, department there when it comes to copyright. And the, you know, that's, that's not good. They, they really got to rein that in because this kind of stuff could really, really, really start hurting them. And nobody, nobody wants that. Jumping over here to birth movies, death saying here that it's official. Eddie Murphy will star in coming to America too. This has been a long gestating rumor, right? It says here rumors of coming to America sequel have been circulating for quite some time, but then rumors about new Eddie Murphy projects are a dime a dozen. 
At various points, he's been linked to Quentin Tarantino, a twin sequel, uh, a new stand-up special, you name it. The excitement that surrounds these rumors is a testament to our enduring love of Eddie Murphy, while the fact that they almost never pan out is a testament to just how difficult it is to get him to sign on to a new project. Today's news is something of a shock. According to Deadline, Murphy has signed on to headline a sequel to 1988's Coming to America, the film that will be directed by Craig Brewer, who just finished working with Murphy on Netflix's Dolomite Is My Name, which is expected to arrive later on in 2019. So what they say here is in the sequel, Akeem learns about a long lost son and must return to America to meet his unlikely heir to the throne of Zamunda. The intention is to bring back the original cast, which includes Arsenio Hall, uh, Sherry Headley, who was courted by the prince when he went undercover as a fast food worker, John Amos, who played her father, and James Earl Jones, who played the king. Well, that seems a little bit interesting because he, if he's he's got a long lost son in America, like they were they returned to Zamunda at the end of the movie, right? And Coming to America is a great movie. I love this movie to death. But he, he I mean, clearly he wasn't a virgin. Clearly he wasn't. You know, there's. I mean. Clearly, he wasn't a virgin. If in the opening act of the movie, the opening scene of the movie, when he's getting clean, the girl pops her head out from underneath the water and says, the royal penis is clean, your highness. And he looks at the camera and kind of smirks. It's like, yeah, you know, like clearly he had a little bit of fun. So it's entirely possible that the dude just didn't have any protection on him at some point. And listen, the pullout method ain't always what it claims to be. Uh, so yeah, that could be, that could be a, a thing, but here, here's the reality of it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't like the story. I don't, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll check it out if it's, if it's coming and it's, it's, it's Eddie Murphy in a, in a, in a comedy role that looks interesting. I will definitely watch it, but I'm also not engaged to it enough to it to make it go. Yeah, this is, this is going to be wonderfully amazing. This is going to be fantastic. I just, I don't know, man, it's nothing about it really kind of, uh, really kind of really kind of blows my skirt up so to speak <laughs> my royal penis is not clean over this and that's probably the worst joke i've made all week and finally today guys the final destination reboot enters development with saw writers do we need to reboot final destination do we really need to reboot final destination the answer to that is obviously <laughs> no but this is the world we find ourselves living in that says the Final Destination reboot enters development with Saw writers. The Hollywood Reporter has brought word that the fan favorite New Line Cinema horror franchise Final Destination is getting a reboot treatment from Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstain. Uh, so it says here that, yeah, they uh, they joined. These guys joined the long running Saw franchise, beginning with the fourth installment and continuing with the seventh and final entry. And they're known to have scripted the 2012 monster horror film Piranha 3DD. Uh, well, I really enjoyed Piranha 3D from 2010. So it appears that, uh, this is obviously coming in from the success of the, uh, the, the conjuring franchise, that whole universe. Uh, so this is what it looks like. It looks like these guys are just very much trying to, the, the producers are trying to capitalize on this trend and they think that bringing back F final destination is going to be a good way of doing it. I mean, it's when they say saw writers, you know, then they talk about the last few films. The last few films were okay. The writing was okay. I thought Saw 4 had pretty decent writing. Uh, the final couple, eh, not so much, but the, the fourth one was pretty solid. But when you say Saw writers, to me, it's like Lee Wannell, right? You want Lee Wannell to come in and take this on. Now, he obviously is off doing his own thing. Upgrade just came out this past year. He had that brief cameo appearance as the pilot of the plane in Aquaman and, and quite frankly, like I would rather see him tackle the subject matter than, than the guys who handled like the later half of the, of the series of saw when by that point in time, uh, it was still just a yearly release because it made 30 million in its opening weekend. So Lionsgate just wanted to shit these movies out and they didn't really offer anything new to the torture porn genre and ultimately kind of led to its eventual demise. Seven saw movies. That's a lot of freaking saw movies. We didn't need that many, but uh, here we go. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with this one, what they bring to the table. I don't quite know if they're going to be able to do anything with Final Destination that's going to make it worth. <laughs> What's the word I want to use here? If they're going to be able to do anything that's going to going to make it fresh and interesting. The concept is interesting, right? You 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 cheat death, death comes back to kick you square in the dick, right? That's funny to me. That's interesting to me. 
But at the same time, there were five uh, Final Destination movies with the sixth movie that never came through. They tried to kind of reboot it with the Final Destination, if you remember the last one. And it was interesting. Or they even tried going to 3D gimmick in Final Destination 3. And it just kind of ran its course. What Hollywood needs to do is not focus on these reboots and these remakes of decades old films. They need to get writers in there that understand what is currently scary about today, about where we are today. Cheating death and have it come after you in, a, in, in, in over the top ways is going to be a fun spectacle. And with the modernization of today's technology, it could be a lot more achievable and probably more inexpensive if done right. But you're never going to be able to recreate a plane crash like that, or you're never going to be able to recreate the opening of uh of what was it? Uh, Final Destination Two with the with the the log truck on the freeway and that whole car accident sequence. You know there are they've kind of run their course. I'd say let them be. And here's the thing: the guy who who created the original movie, Jeffrey Reddick, him and I have been friends since 2010. I mean, we've known each other since 2010. We're friends on Facebook, right? I'm not name dropping or anything. I'm just putting that out there. But uh, I'd rather see him come back because he brought a fresh take to the concept back in 2000 and 2000 when the first one came out. Yeah. Uh, or 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. He brought a fresh take to it. So bring him back. Don't give me guys who came in to kind of clean up saws, you know, sloppy seconds, so to speak. I don't know. Those are just my thoughts on this one. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. I appreciate you guys watching uh, every day this week. It's been a lot of fun. The news today is 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 kind of it's a shorter episode because there really really wasn't too much going on, and uh, I got a couple voicemails that came in, but they were kind of unintelligible. So unfortunately, I couldn't uh, play them. One of them was, hoof, completely inappropriate to play, uh, and 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 I just wasn't going to do it. So I do appreciate that. But if you guys, uh, if you if you do want to call in, you can at uh, 818-350-3281. That's 818-350-3281. Uh, and I will I will see you guys on Monday for another episode of Three Buck Theater. Have yourself a great weekend. Go to the movies and peace out.